All right, lesson seven in uh, uh, the book of John, uh, lesson run, number 16 rather, in the book of John, chapter seven. So open your Bibles to chapter seven, the book of John. Now after having completed six chapters of John's gospel, you're surely beginning to note that a lot of his book is really a dialogue. You know, John is writing down you know, the conversation that Jesus is having with different individuals. For example, uh, Jesus and the people in general. The dialogue Jesus is having with the crowds that continually follow Him. Um, the dialogue between Jesus and His disciples, people who openly said, we are your followers. The dialogue between Jesus and His apostles, Jesus and individuals like Nicodemus, for example, and the Samaritan woman, just one-on-one -on -one type things. Uh, the dialogue between Jesus and His enemies, you know, the Jewish leadership. And of course, uh, the dialogue between Jesus and the people that come to Him for help uh, or healing. So John recounts these dialogues as they took place in Jerusalem or on the way to Jerusalem or in the northern part of the country like Galilee and the towns around the lake um, or the Sea of Galilee. So, so far, uh, that's, that's chapters one to six, just a lot of dialogue. Today we start chapter seven and we see a very rare dialogue between Jesus and His own family concerning His ministry. Um, then the dialogue between the people themselves um, concerning Jesus in Jerusalem. So I just want you to kind of note that idea that this is a lot of John's writing is just Jesus said this, the crowd said that, Jesus said this, and so on and so forth, okay? Now we know from other passages in Matthew 12, for example, 46 and 7, and Mark chapter 6, verse 3, that Jesus had both brothers and sisters, uh, earthly brothers and sisters. Mark even names the brothers James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And John gives us a very rare glimpse of what things were like for Jesus at home. So let's, that's where chapter seven begins, verse one and two. It says, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for He was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill Him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. And so John is describing the overall picture. It had become dangerous for Jesus to be in Jerusalem. He had already been branded as a, you know, a troublemaker and risked being arrested if He went into the capital city. Now the Feast of Booths, a couple of pictures I have for you, sometimes the, called the Feast of Tabernacles, was celebrated in the month of October. Uh, it was a time of celebration for the season's harvest of grain. You know, it was a harvest festival, if you wish. Uh, the fruit and uh, the, the wine, the grapes that would uh, come in at that time. Uh, it, was also a, um, it was also a commemorative feast remembering the escape from Egypt. The idea being that they, they had homes that they lived in in Egypt. When they escaped, they lived in tents and they lived out in the wilderness. So the Feast of Booths was there to remind them of the time that they were wandering uh, in, the, um, in the desert and there was no harvest. You know, God was feeding them uh, miraculously. And so one of the things um, about the feast, the, the men were required to attend and for the week-long festival, thousands of booths or tents were erected outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem where people would stay. And uh, this is a modern uh, picture, modern view. Uh, I don't know if I have another picture of it. No, okay. This is a, a modern view uh, in, uh, I don't know what city it is, uh, but you see people have built these booths. Some uh, condos, by the way, I've read in New York City that some uh, Jews, some Orthodox Jews, have built these tents or these type of booths on their porches outside. And the condo association has sued them for defacing the property and going against the covenant you know, of the condo owners. But anyways, even to this day, many Jews celebrate that. So we read in verse three, four, and five, it says, therefore his brothers said to him, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. 
And so John recounts a very personal moment between Jesus and his earthly brothers. Now the key here, of course, is that the brothers did not believe in Jesus. You, know, you have to put that in, the, in that framework. They didn't believe in Jesus. So their comments have to be taken in that light. Note also the cycle of belief and disbelief shows up even here, even in his own home. So even though these men, James, Jude, Joseph, and Simon, didn't believe in him as the Messiah, they were quick to point out how he should conduct his ministry. And their point actually makes sense from an earthly perspective. You know, they're saying, look, if you want to be known, why waste your time and energy around here? I mean, Galilee, you know, scarcely populated, it's not important, it's up north, it's up in the boondocks. What, what? Don't waste your time here, they said. Go where the action is, go to Jerusalem, especially while the crowds are there for the feast. You know, there'll be a lot of people, now's the time to get your word out. You, know? you ever notice people who are not believers always know how you ought to live? You know, I, I've always found that interesting, even in my own family, people who are believers but not practicing believers, let's put it that way, they have all kinds of advice for me on how I should do my, my ministry. You know? So this is nothing new, it's all, you, you got to smile when you see how they're treating him. So they don't believe, they're not going to make the effort to find out, but they give him advice on how he should conduct his ministry. Perhaps they thought that if, you know, on a long shot, he turned out to be the great savior and king the Jews believed the Messiah would be, they wanted to be on his good side. You know, they wanted to say, hey, remember, we, we're the ones that told you to go to Jerusalem. We're the ones that gave you all that good advice. So they're kind of hedging their bet here. Now, we learn later that they were converted after Jesus' resurrection. James became an elder and a leader of the Jerusalem congregation. He also wrote the epistle of James. Historians tell us that he was thrown from the city walls and stoned to death as a Christian martyr. Uh, Jude went on to write the epistle of Jude. We, I've talked about that in another lesson. We don't know a whole lot about Jude, but we do know that. And so uh, let's continue the dialogue, verse uh, six and seven. So Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it, that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. So Jesus explains that the time to do what they want him to do, in other words, to manifest or show himself as the Messiah in Jerusalem, this time, he says, is not at hand. He's going to do it, but the time is not right. They think that going among the crowds to do miracles, man, that's the way to go. If you can do miracles, go down to the crowd. Wow the crowd, you know, they'll, they'll accept you. Jesus knows that dying on the cross and resurrecting, this is how He will manifest Himself. The miracles are to support that, but the, the key reason why He's come is to die on the cross. They, they have no idea of that. And so the time to do that manifestation, the death and the burial and resurrection, that time hasn't, hasn't come yet. But Jesus says their time is always ready because they have, they have no mission. They have no set mission. They're free to go to the festival. They're free to return and go back to their jobs. They're free to believe at any time. That's what he means. Your time is always ready. At any time you can believe. You can do what you want. So they can do these things because they're not under restriction, nor are they under attack like he is. So Jesus' movements, you know, they're pretty limited at this time because he's hated by those that he's denounced. When you denounce the leadership of sin, watch out. You know, there's a guy who wrote a book. Uh, he, he often publishes articles in the paper, and I, his name escapes me for now, but I remember, the, I remember the, uh, the title of his book. He's a minister, I think he's a uh, Presbyterian minister, something like that, and he wrote a book called 10 Things My Church Needs to Hear, But I Need My Job. <laughs> I think every preacher has that challenge. You know, there are things that they probably think they need to say, but they also need to hang on to their job as well. So, always, so again, nothing new uh, under, nothing new under the, the sun. So Jesus encourages his brothers to go, but he tells them that he will not go, not, not that he's not going to go. 
He just tells him, I'm not going to go for the reasons that you want me to go. Sometimes when you read this, you're saying, well, is Jesus not being a hypocrite? He tells them he's not going and then secretly he goes? No. He's telling them, I'm not going for the reason. You go ahead, but I'm not going to go to go down there and do miracles. It doesn't mean he doesn't want to go, just that he's not going to go with their motives and their plan. So we keep reading verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. So the scene now changes to Jerusalem where there's no lack of controversy over Jesus and his, and his claims. And John shows that the people were divided in their opinion of him, but they were united in their common fear of the leadership and the opposition of the Jews. So the people were caught in a difficult spot as well. So with Jesus now gone to Jerusalem, not with a triumphal, miraculous entry as his brothers had suggested, but a kind of a secret one among the people the scene is now set for yet another dialogue. So we saw the dialogue between himself and his brothers. Now Jesus goes to Jerusalem. The scene is set. He's going to have a dialogue with individuals in Jerusalem. And, um, and John is going to record this. So now we have the dialogue between Jesus and the crowd. Uh, there we go. And that's chapter 7, 14, all the way down to 53. And we're going to read through that. I'm going to make some comments. So the stage is set. Um, and uh, if you want to understand what's going on, you have to go back to verse 7 where Jesus gives the real reason for His opposition. The real reason that the leaders are opposing Him is because He reveals the sins of the people and they don't like it. Nobody likes to have their sins, or nobody likes to, that to happen to them. And so that's nothing new, that's human nature. In His dialogue with the people and the leaders in Jerusalem, He's going to do this very thing. He's going to reveal the sin and the hypocrisy of the crowd as well as the Jewish leaders. And he does this by responding to their various charges. So first of all, the crowd charges him with being incompetent. Verse 14, but when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned, having never been educated? So uh, they were impressed with his teaching, but they questioned his credentials. If he couldn't show proper credentials in having been trained in one of the rabbinical schools, how credible could his teaching be? Uh, the Jewish leaders asked the crowd this rhetorical question in an effort to discredit Jesus publicly. That's not the crowd. You know, these are the leaders and they're saying, you know, can you believe this guy? He, he, never, he didn't go to the top schools. He didn't go to Harvard. You know, he doesn't have a doctorate in theology. How, how, could he, you know, how, how can you listen to a guy like this? He's not qualified. So that was their way of trying to discredit him. So Jesus comes right back at these leaders with three points. Verse 16, uh, he, so Jesus answered them and said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God, whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? And so Jesus gives them three points in answer. One, he says, the teaching he gives is not his own. It's the teaching of God who sent him. That's the, if they disagree with his teaching, they're disagreeing with God. Number two, he says, anyone who claims to know God will do God's will, and by this will be proven to be illegitimate. And then he, now he charges them. He says, you failed this test because you misinterpret God's will that was given to you by Moses, and you're trying to kill me. And then thirdly, he says, those who speak by their own authority seek their own glory. Those who speak with God's authority want to glorify God. 
The implication on this one is that it was evident who received the glory from his ministry and who received the glory and the honor when the Jewish leaders taught and practiced their religion. Remember, the miracles that he make. You know, that, that's the confirmation. When he says the glory, he's talking about, hey, who, who's got the glory? Who does God glorify in ministry? You know, he doesn't go out and spell it out, but if we were to read between the lines, it's, does he glorify me? through the miracles that you've seen me do? Or does he glorify your leaders? No miracles there. They're sowing dissension, fear, okay? So then the crowd comes back, they charge him with being demon possessed. The crowd answered, you have a demon, who seeks to kill you? Jesus said, answered them, I did one deed and you all marvel. For this, re see, the y'all is in the Bible. Uh, for this reason Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, he says, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And so the Lord doesn't even address their charge that he's incompetent. But he sh uh, uh, that he's, uh, he's demon possessed, but he shows by his unfailing insight that he's not crazy or possessed at all. He explains the charge that he had made against the leaders in his previous statement. In reference to a miracle, uh, the miracle is the one where he healed the lame man on the Sabbath. And because of that, he was accused of sinning because he healed on the Sabbath. Now this was also the cause of great anger and violence directed toward him by the Jewish leaders. They were mad at him because he was healing on the Sabbath. He was breaking the Sabbath law of working on the Sabbath. In effect, Jesus shows how his miracle is in perfect accord with Moses, even when done on the Sabbath. So he explains that the law on circumcision given by Moses, but originated long before Moses through Abraham, that that circumcision commanded that each male child be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This was done even if the eighth day fell on a Sabbath day. So since circumcision was the sign that a person was blessed by God by being included as part of the chosen people, not by birth, but by obedience, you didn't become part of the chosen people because you were simply born to Jewish parents. You became part of the chosen people when you were circumcised. That's an important distinction here. All right? So this ritual of circumcision was a ritual of blessing and it didn't violate the Sabbath even when it was performed on the Sabbath. Why? Because God was blessing you. God was including you among the chosen people through that circumcision. That was a blessing. And if God wants to bless you, even on the Sabbath day, He is not violating His own law. That, that's, the, that's the thinking that Jesus is using here. Well, He says, in the same way, the healing of the man, which was done on the Sabbath, was not wrong because he was receiving a special blessing, again, that only God could give. Now, if, if Jesus you know, saw a homeless person and said, oh, I'll build you a house, and he and the apostles got together, you know, like uh, those shows uh, on TV, you know, in 24 hours they build a house, you know, the 12 apostles and Jesus, after all, he was a carpenter, they build the guy a new house on the Sabbath. Okay, that's work. Then the leaders could have said, couldn't you have waited till the next day or the day before? Why did you have to work to do this on the Sabbath? But what Jesus did for the lame man, that was something that no man could do. God was working. God was working through Jesus, if you will. The Spirit was working through Jesus to heal that man. So that man was receiving a blessing directly from God. And because of that, was not violating any Sabbath law. So even if it was done on the Sabbath, it was okay. Because like circumcision, a person was being blessed by God. This was not a work of man, it was a blessing from God and he chose to give it on the Sabbath. So Jesus encourages them to judge correctly, to see the utter rightness of what had happened, that it, it did not in any way violate the law of the Sabbath. The appearance 
was what the Jewish leaders were trying to make out of it. He's saying, judge it for what it really is, God's will being done even on the Sabbath through a special blessing. So you have to understand that nuance there to see how you know, Jesus is making the argument uh, to the, um, uh, it's not just, hey, I do what I want, I'm God, you guys get out of here. No, no, he's arguing this case from their perspective, from the perspective of the law. They're saying the law says you can't do this, and Jesus is showing him that the law does permit, using their argument to win them over. All right, next, they charge him with being a pretender. Verse 25, 26, and 27. So some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he's speaking publicly, and they're saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? However, we know where this man is from, but whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. So Jesus is speaking to the pilgrims, the out-of-towners, but now the very citizens of Jerusalem speak up, um, testifying of their own more authoritative inside information about Jesus. Yeah, it's okay for these pilgrims to believe in, in Him. They don't, they don't know what's going on, but we know what's going on. We know the law, we know the scriptures. And you know what, the scriptures say, you know, this Jesus, you know, nobody knows where He's from. The scriptures tell us where uh, uh, the Messiah is going to come from. The Messiah is going to come from around Jerusalem. Well, you know, uh, Bethlehem, not, not too far from Jerusalem. So they have, they feel, a more concrete reason for denying him and casting him as a mere pretender. For example, the, the rulers, the leaders, they don't believe him. He says they want to kill him, but he's, he's here, he's speaking openly. You know, they're, they're making the argument that if the leaders wanted to kill him, he'd be dead already. But here he is speaking openly, so that you know, he's a pretender, he's, he's making a false argument. And then they say, we know that the scriptures teach that the Messiah will come from this area, our area, Bethlehem, which is near Jerusalem in the district of Judea, not from some hick town up north, up in Galilee. So they dismiss the pilgrims as being without proper information, and they dismiss Jesus as being from the wrong place. This is their reason for disbelieving. Of course, they have completely discounted, so the miracle is the problem. <laughs> the miracle is the problem. They're trying to answer the miracle with the idea that, well, he's not from the right place, so surely he can't be the Messiah. And so, uh, in answer, Jesus responds to their ignorance. In verse 28 and nine, he says, then Jesus cried out in the temple teaching and saying, you both know me and know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. So there's a little play on words here that we need to look at. In modern speech, this is what he'd be saying. He'd be saying, you think you know me? You think you know where I'm from? You don't even know what you think you know. I'm from God and I know this because I know Him and you don't know Him because you, know, you have no knowledge of God. So we see that in movies, eh? You think you know me? You don't know me. You know? Well, this is what he's saying. You think you know me? You people think you actually know me to judge me? You don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know where I'm from and you don't know the one who sent me. And so the citizens and the pilgrims and the leaders are divided now. Uh, verse uh, 30 to 32, it's, so they were seeking to seize him and no man laid his hands on him because his hour had not yet come. But many of the crowd believed in him and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which uh, this man has done. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. And so they're upset now, the crowd. Uh, even the citizens are siding with the leaders in wanting to seize him, but their confusion prevents any action. This is because God will not allow any action against the Lord before the appointed time. So the crowd 
and the pilgrims assess the situation, they realize that they can't dismiss a great miracle that Jesus has done, no matter what people think. The Pharisees, seeing the situation, begin to unravel, uh, join forces with their, national, uh, their, their natural antagonists, which would be the priests. You know, they see the thing falling apart with the crowd. So what do they do? To stop the momentum that's beginning to build behind Jesus, they order the soldiers to go arrest Him. Guy who's speaking out, guy who's getting a crowd, guy who's stirring people up, a guy who's pointing out all their, I mean it happens in Russia and it happens in China, right? You got a, a guy who's writing a blog, who's got some inside information about the party, and he starts, you know, what happens to that guy in his blog? All of a sudden he's charged with some crime, you know, whatever, and, and you don't see him again. Well, same thing, you know, evil people, use the same tactics you know, century after century. So they give official orders to have Jesus arrested by the temple guard. They just can't go in and haul him away. This might cause further trouble. They're not going to seek an opportunity. In essence, they say to the guards, follow him. Follow him. And when you have an opportunity, snatch him. So Jesus now responds, remember I told you at the beginning, it's a dialogue, back and forth and back and forth. He talks to the crowd, he talks to the leaders, back and forth, back and forth. So 33 to 36, therefore Jesus said, for a little while longer I'm with you, then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot, um, you cannot come. So knowing that the end is near, six months to go now, six months before his death and resurrection, Jesus looks ahead and he declares that he will soon return to where he came from. He came from God and to God he will return. That's what he's talking about. That's where he's going, looking ahead to his crucifixion. And this of course is in response to the efforts of the Jews to find and seize him. He says, you're going to look for me, you're going to try to arrest me. So he's saying, soon I'm going to be in a place that you're not going to be able to follow. And this is because as disbelievers, they will not be able to come to the right hand of God, eventually. That's their judgment. He's pronouncing judgment. That's what that is. That's not just, well, you cannot transfer and you can't go. This is, I'm going to be at the right hand of God and you, you don't know where that is and you, there's no way you can get there. Now they're really confused. They think he's afraid of capture and he's going to escape to continue his preaching to the Jews who live outside the country in other nations. That was that the dispersion, uh, that comment about dispersion, that's, that's who they're talking about. So by their answer and by their speculation, they prove that they don't understand at all the words that he has spoken and they uh, have quoted. The bottom line is this, they still don't get it. They still don't get it. So now we come to the end of the chapter. Jesus makes a final plea, verse 37. He says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So before Jesus made the plea to believe in Him in terms of eating His flesh, drinking His blood. Now He changes the imagery to offer yet another benefit of faith and that's the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Drinking of Him, another way of saying believing in Him. He is, remember I told you in the past He uses all kinds of metaphors, all kinds of uh, uh, terms to say the very same thing. So drinking Him is believing in Him, and if they do that, that will enable you of never being thirsty again, because the source to quench thirst will become part of you, you know, a river that is inside of you. So in context, Jesus promises those who believe in Him, they'll not suffer from the spiritual ignorance and blindness that these people demonstrate, because the Holy Spirit who reveals God will become part of them. 
Now in verse 39, John makes an, an editorial note here for the reader to explain when this promise would be fulfilled. So for anyone who's reading his gospel, who is a believer, they know that what John says in 739, that for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, that only happened after. For the apostles, right? Uh, at some point in John you'll see Jesus say, and He breathed on them the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling that they received. And then on the day of Pentecost, they were empowered. In other words, He empowered them with the Spirit to do miracles and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, the people's reaction to Jesus' appearance in Jerusalem at the Feast of Booths. In verse, uh, let's talk about the crowd. How did they respond to Jesus? Said Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. So the crowd's response, the crowds were divided. Some believed because of the miracles, some doubted because of what the citizens said about his birthplace. You know, my, my question is, why didn't they just ask him <laughs> you know, somehow? But anyways. All right, so that's the crowd's response to what he has said. The temple guards, they have a response as well. Uh, the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, why did you not bring him, you know, bring him in? And the officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. So the temple guards, they, failed to they followed him, but they didn't arrest him because they were dazzled by his teaching and they didn't find any, you know, any opening to seize him. The response of the leaders, the Pharisees and the leaders, uh, says, um, uh, the Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers of Pharisees have believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. So the Pharisees, you know, they were Jesus' fiercest enemies because it was their teachings and their hypocrisies that Jesus denounced. They dismissed the crowd, they dismissed the guards as ignorant and uninformed. So that's, that's the response. Um, Nicodemus then uh, he who came to him before, being not one of them, said to them, our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? There's the cycle of belief and disbelief among the leaders. They answered him, you're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Everyone went to his home. Note that the cycles of belief and disbelief continue. Among the crowd, some believe, the miracles, others disbelieved because of a technical point. They, didn't, they weren't sure where he was from. Uh, the guards, you know, they were just dazzled. The leadership, his enemy, even among the leadership, some were believing. Nicodemus is there and he is saying, hey, you know, do we try a man before we, 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 we hear him say what he's saying? You know, the, Nicodemus is kind of coming out here. You know, his faith is starting to is starting to show and the leaders are beginning to see that Jesus' influence is even permeating among the leadership. Now they're really panicking. Okay? All right, so I think we've covered uh, chapter seven, a long chapter, that's why we had to kind of move quickly, but if we understand the, um, the way John is writing this thing, uh, his gospel dialogue, just who's he talking to? How are they, you know, how are they responding to him? and remember the cycles. Belief, disbelief, belief, disbelief. Okay, all right, so that's it. We're going to pick up chapter eight in our next session. Thank you very much for your attention.